Hello and welcome to Beyond Backup, the game-changing approach to pure storage disaster recovery. Today's webinar is sponsored by Pure Storage and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. Now, we've got two dynamic presenters today who are going to be just grabbing your questions as they come in over the console. So just type them in there as, as soon as, as, uh, as you have something uh, to ask, and uh, hopefully we can get to it right, right then and there. Now, that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Now, second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. I'd especially like to call your attention to a link to learn more about Pure Storage Disaster Recovery as a Service. Um, you can also find some links in there to actual tech media resources. So I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and colleagues. Now, third, at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. Official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section as well. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. Now, finally, one of the best benefits of this event is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenters. So to help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. So after the event is over, the actual tech media team will look at all the questions that came in, pick out the very best one and contact that prize winner. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get to today's fantastic content. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today. We have Lance Boley, who's principal technical product marketing or, uh, uh, at, uh, at Pure Storage, and Matt Bradford, director of technical marketing at, at Pure Storage. Lance and Matt, welcome. Hey, Thank thanks you. a lot, Scott. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, Lance, I'll turn things over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Scott. All right, we'll get past the uh, couple slides here. Scott said we're here to talk about uh, Beyond Backup and the new offering from Pure, the game-changing approach to disaster recovery. So, Matt, you and I have talked a lot about this, but, you know, I've been thinking, what would happen if we came to work about an hour into our shift? I mean, you've probably been there. I know I've been there. Just everything goes offline. Um we lost access to our files. We lost access to our shares. Uh, we can't get to any websites or tools internally because DNS seems to be gone. And just, you know, everybody grinds to a halt, right? So as someone who worked in IT a number of years, as, as you did, right, everybody starts looking at you or looking at us. Oh, yeah. Lance, and, I, I keep all of my IP addresses in a, in a notepad file. So if DNS goes down, it's a slight yeah. inconvenience, but I'm still up and running. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we, we've we've all done that, I'm sure, right? But um, <laughs> right, that that certainly isn't the way we want to run our businesses. So um, it gets to be chaotic because our managers and their managers and the CIO, CTO, they're all looking at IT, right, for those answers, and the work is is being disrupted, and nobody can get anything done. So it looks like we're going to need to cancel our plans for the weekend. Uh, we're going to be here a while. We're going to be in those war rooms and be on crit sick mm. calls or whatever uh, the the phrase is for for today's uh, version of you know critical incident, right? Those those so, were the days, my friend, when when you you've got to like provide yeah fifteen minute updates right. while you're trying to troubleshoot what the heck happened, how to fix it, and you get your boss barking like we need updates. We gotta we gotta you know give the executives all you know let them know what's going on and. Yeah, it's 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 a very stressful situation, and I, you know, throw it in the Q and A um, if if you've experienced this right. uh, recently or or in the past, um, or even if you have like a good story too of, you know, hey, being on call, like uh, I, I, I'm a, I'm a few years out. It's probably safe to uh, to incriminate myself now and say I took a couple of uh, um, 
you know, chances with, with being on call and not necessarily being that close to my laptop all the time. And sure been burned once or twice with uh, a certain three letter storage vendor when one of the storage nodes went down once but um you know for the most part it's okay but yeah it's never going to happen at a good time is it no it, it never is right and you're you're there till you've already worked a full day perhaps you're there late at night you sleep under your desk you get up or maybe you get a chance to go home and come back but it, it definitely mm -hmm. ruins ruins the week or the weekend or any plans that you had with with family and friends for sure so yeah yeah um well you know these attacks are coming at us in all different uh directions right we're, we've got the human errors of course those are those are some that we've probably all experienced um advanced phishing attacks now i know uh, i've seen more and more of those that look absolutely legitimate except for the fact that I don't have an account at Bank of America or Chase Bank, right? So, um, you know, those are those are the ones that, uh, you know, get flagged for me. And then, of course, ransomware that, that sneaks its way in, maybe through some of those phishing attacks. Uh, of course, we can't forget about natural disasters and hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and different things like that. And then, of course, Matt, you've got an interesting one here, a CEO impersonation. Tell me about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, this was crazy because this was I wasn't even a month into my tenure here at, at Pure, maybe maybe right about a month time frame. But yeah, um, get a text message like, hey, it's Charles Giancarlo. Give me a call. What the heck, man? Like, I'm not even sure if I, <laughs> I had time to update my LinkedIn in time. Right. right. Um, so, you know, these these guys are clever and, and catching on to stuff really quick. Um, so, yeah, it just kind of shows how how intricate and how evolved Right. All of these scams have, have gotten and, and to try to get you to click that button or make that phone call to, you know, whatever, basically, essentially, you know, leads to revenue generation um, right. for, for bad actors. So um, right. they're, they're getting very, very clever. And, and, and I'll say, too, on this slide, Lance, there, there's one thing missing that you had on the previous slide that I just love is is the subtle little blue screen of death that you had right. on there. Right. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just absolutely love that. And and those reboot and reboot and reboot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Those those were uh, those those were the the fun days, right? Or the not so fun days, whichever. Mm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, you know that kind of leads us into um, the requirement today, right? I know when when I was in in the trenches, we'll say that uptime that requirement to be online wasn't as critical that was a number of years ago i'm probably aging myself here a little bit but you know today's world we need those four nines some companies need five nines and when we break that down it's 52 minutes of unplanned outages per year that's not a lot of time and um you know you, we talked about the 15 minute updates or updates every 15 minutes sometimes it takes 16 minutes to create those updates, right? So it's hard to just do some of that basic thing as far as troubleshooting. So imagine you can only be down for 52 minutes a year. That just, that number just kind of really boggles me that, you know, that's not a lot of time. So very no. critical. Exactly. And, and, you know, the reasons for that too, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I love your comment of, you know, I'm so old that, uh, <laughs> You know, we only had back in my day, we only had two nines of availability or one nine. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, the reasons being is is obviously we, we live in a world where, you know, you go online, you get that instant, well, pseudo instant yeah. gratification, right, of being able to buy that product, get it delivered to your house very quickly. Like we've all come become very accustomed to all of that. So uh, naturally, you know, your business, you're going to have an online presence, obviously. So what happens when your customers can't access your stuff? Well, they're going to go to a competitor um, in many cases, maybe not so much if you're a hospital, but, you know, customers, are, you're going to start to lose business too, right? Sure. So not only yeah. are your employees not able to do their job, um, but also, you know, you're, you're losing business to the competitors that you may not get back. And it's going to take years and, you know, millions of dollars to, to get that business back. So yeah, things, things are very different from, from when, uh, you know, Lance, you and I were just dealing with our one nines of availability. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, so kind of how we get to this point of, of being able to 
only be down for 15 minutes or have those four nines, five nines, is we've got to have a complete data resilient strategy. Um, being in the storage business that we are here at Pure, we understand snapshots, high availability, of course, right? Snapshots are those instant um, volume level we can recover from 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 a volume uh, being down. But let's say I just need a file, or let's say I need just a virtual machine out of that volume, right? Well, I, I can't do that. I can't get that little piece of data back that brings my DNS server back online, for example, right? Um, then of course, high availability, that's great. Natural disaster really comes to mind for those things. We've, we've replicated our data, it's milliseconds amount of time uh, from one site to the other. Well, that's great if that site goes down. I mean, it's bad that the site goes down because of a disaster, right? But we have that quickly available on, on the other side. Well, but what about in the case of ransomware, those phishing attacks or mm -hmm. those things that get in? Well. I mean, that data gets replicated along with it, and you probably have no idea when that happens because you didn't have any idea when it when it came in in the first place, right? So we turn to stuff like backups, right? Those are point in time. We can get a file level recovery if we need it. We can get that individual virtual machine, bring up that application that's on that virtual machine. Th those are all good, but again, point in time. There's no orchestration with that. It's very manual. It's very, uh, well, we gotta go find it, right? Uh, different things like that. So um, then, of course, we've got the traditional disaster recovery, what I'm going to call traditional anyway. Um, you've got a secondary site. Maybe it's a colo facility. Maybe it's a provider that's providing you with it. Maybe it's even in the cloud. Um, but you got to orchestrate that um, to to that site. And that can sometimes come with, with a big price tag because you've got, you know, hardware and, and different things over there as well. So um, really, we just want to simplify the way disaster recovery and build on that uh, resiliency strategy. So what is a what is a good strategy then, Lance? I mean, there's a lot of really good technologies here that all have their own strengths and weaknesses. So what what is a good strategy? Well, I think I think the one we're going to talk about a little more is is a very good one. Um, having it as a service um, is mm -hmm. is a good strategy to have. Um, for sure. So, um, but, al but also having, having all of the, maybe not all of these, but having multiple strategies in place as well, oh, right? Sure. Like with disaster recovery, you're not gonna be able to do your file level recovery. I mean, you can, you can spin up a VM and pull a file down, but you're not gonna be able to do it as effectively, efficiently as, as you could with backups. Um, but then, you know, high availability and snapshots certainly play a, play a role in that too, right? Snapshots, like you said, like they're, they're instant. Um, you know, they can be immutable as well, right? So uh, think of safe mode with, with pure storage where your snapshots cannot be manually eradicated, which is a really, you know, word we use for deletions, right? right. Um, so if you get attacked by ransomware, like they're, they're going to be in your environment for, um, you know, months before the attack actually occurs because they're going to be trying to figure out how do they get access to all of this stuff to ensure that your ransom's paid. Right. right. Um, so if that means going in and deleting backups and deleting snapshots and things like that. Right. You really need a, a multiple pronged approach because you get multiple risks. Right. Like we said at the beginning, you sure. get natural disasters, you get, you know, phishing, human error, you get ransomware, all of these sorts of things. So, you know, really a good strategy is to have multiple solutions. Right. And that's, you know, we're, we're not here to say just use disaster recovery, but, um, you know, certainly employ uh, a, a number of uh, a number of these things. Yeah, right. A absolutely. Like, you know, all four of these are, are very important as, as, as you've indicated for sure. For sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, so tell me about disaster recovery. What's the well, downside yeah. to it? <laughs> well, it can be complicated, right? I mean, I think we've touched on a couple of those things. Uh, traditionally, we, we've talked about the secondary data center a little bit, a colo. Maybe you've even uh, done a hybrid cloud. Well, you've, you've got a little bit uh, on-prem, you got a little bit in the cloud, those kind of things. Well, there's there's uh, complexity with with all of these, and of course, there's expense, and they and some of these can be more expensive than the other. Um, you've got that secondary data center, uh, hardware's running, uh, it's consuming power, cooling, uh, all those things is taking up. Uh, you know, I don't know how many tiles on a, on a floor somewhere, depending on the size of your your business and the things that you need and 
And of course, there's expenses that go with that, right? Same kind of for the co-location. Um, you know, they're going to charge you at a different rate uh, for, for, for different things. So um, all of this hardware, you know, typically is running all the time. You're doing some sort of replication jobs across to make sure that the data is up to date and kind of the same with the hybrid cloud provider, right? Well, you got to staff not only your primary data center, you got to have staffing either at these other locations to, hey, I've got a power supply that went bad in my in my secondary data center. I've got a drive failure. Those things need to be replaced, right? So you need to have staff on hand to, to take care of those things. And of course, um, the licensing that goes with everything and then, well, how do I get the, the data from primary to secondary or primary to colo, right? You've got to have some sort of utilities. Um, and those come with their own challenges, right? And complexity as far as licensing and expertise from the staffing to know how to, how to operate all those. So there's, there's not really only an easy solution. And this has traditionally been, been what we've had to deal with. So we, we kind of take a scale back approach a lot of times, but. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, it's, it's a two time expense, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're paying for this, whether it's a co-location or hybrid cloud provider, or secondary data center, you're spending essentially double the money for infrastructure that you hope you never have to use. It's, it's right. crazy, right? right? I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe you're recycling your, uh, you know, previous gen hardware for your secondary data center just to have something and try to save a little bit of budget. But, you know, to your point, Lance, then you still need the staffing because you're going to see a lot more failures as those, um, you know, pieces of hardware are, uh, are aging out and maybe even end of support too. So what do you do at that point? Um, yeah. but yeah, just the whole idea disaster recovery is just a, a, a crazy idea of, um, we're just going to spend, you know, millions of dollars in, in hopes that we never have to use it. And, you know, obviously that causes a lot of organizations to have to weigh out that risk too. Do I want to take the risk of, you know, the ransom may be, you know, a million dollars, it may be 2 million for your secondary data center with the facilities and everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, you're really going to weigh things out. Not to mention this whole thing becomes a, a major project, doesn't it? Right. You it need does. to yeah. figure out between your storage teams, your virtualization, hardware, networking, right? All these teams need to come together to architect a solution that's going to help, you know, protect your business when crap hits the fan. But everybody has their own caveats and, you know, limitations. Well, you know, it'd be great if we could do stretch layer two, but oh, networking won't do it because of X, Y, and Z. And right, you know, you all have to come together, but you're going to do it over multiple times too. You know, I, I certainly live this Lance. I'm sure you, you live this too of, you know, you, you come, the, the, you know, directive comes from on high that we need disaster recovery. Okay, great. Well, you know, we could give you zero RTO, zero RPO. Yes, that sounds great. That's what we want, right? right? But then that comes with all the cost. And it's like, well, that's right. really expensive. And then the ransomware piece of it too, right? You're replicating all of that data. Okay, well, all right. Well, you know, here's, we're thinking a lot less money than that. All right, you go back and you re-architect and re-architect till finally, you know, you either come up with an idea that works or, you shelf that project again for another year. Um, yeah. So, and you, and you, yeah, cross, you cross your fingers, right? And you hope nothing happens, right? Right. Yeah. Get that resume ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there have been some some solutions, uh, disaster recovery as a service solutions, and and um, I wanted to talk about a little bit a little bit about those, and maybe, maybe some of the drawbacks that we haven't thought about before, right? So there are some disadvantages to traditional disaster recovery as a service. And I think the big one, especially uh, probably today, you know, one and two here on this slide, the data custody and the security. So with data custody, the you're relying on that provider to manage that data. Um, maybe it's in their data center, maybe it's in a public cloud that they're kind of front ending for you. Um, Really, it's just, it's transparent to you. You don't know. You're putting your trust in them that they're going to manage and put your data where it needs to be. And I know here in the United States, um, we like to keep our data here. Uh, in, in other countries, right, they're required to keep it in their country or in a location, not outside of, of their particular region, right? So that becomes an important thing on maintaining that custody and the sovereignty of that data. Yeah. And if you're a multinational corporation, right? Yeah. That GDPR is going to certainly apply to you all. Yep. Right. So, yeah. 
Well, and then and then right security of the data. Can can you you think they'd let you do a penetration test on their systems, Matt? I mean, you know, you could try, but uh, probably just, breach a contract by doing it. You might, yeah. So <laughs> a lot of times, right? You don't have that visibility into the architecture. You don't know how it's being isolated. I mean, some providers do a decent job of of providing some of the details, but at the end of the day, you just you just don't know, right? There's there's these kind of black boxes or or don't pay attention to you know the man behind the curtain kind of kind of scenarios. Um, <laughs> Nothing and, and to see here. Move along. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know, a lot of them have good reputations, but then again, uh, you know, there's risk. Um, you don't know who's behind the scenes, who maybe is uh, accessing your data that isn't authorized to do so. And right, maybe they have a data breach and it takes them three months to find it or discover it or let you know that it happened. Um, right. Those are all painful things that that some companies that, you know, we, we hear about, we read about in the news, of course. Right. Well, We'll, we'll put yourself in like in, in attacker's shoes too, right? Yeah. That's, this sounds like Fort Knox. Not only can I get, you know, the, the actual DRAS company themselves to pay the ransom, but also all of their customers, if I could only get access to that data, right? Like, yeah, yeah what a, what a big target uh, these things are. Exactly. Well, and that kind of goes into that, that expertise area, the kind of last bullet here, the last number, right? You're trusting that that black box is going to keep that data secure and you're reliant on the expertise of them. And like you said, I mean, it could be a, it could be a two for one. Uh, mm-hmm. They get the the hosting company uh, and the company's uh, data as well and, and, and exploit that. So none of those yeah. things are, are good for sure. Well, also, you know, when, when something goes wrong, right? Like, okay, yeah. we're all IT people. We love calling our ISPs when things are wrong. Like, well, did you reboot the router? Yes. I rebooted the, you know, like yeah. trying to call support when when your virtual machine isn't reachable, right? You don't have to to your point, Lance. You don't have the insights into the infrastructure to be able to know. Okay, here's where the traffic's stopping. Here's why I can't reach the virtual machine. You're mm-hmm. gonna rely on their support, and you know a lot of times when you do call into support, it's a matter of having to prove that it's not your fault. It's something on their side, right? So um, there's there's a lot of frustration, uh, you know, with that as well, especially when you just need to get this crap up and running fast. Yeah, because, right, your your boss is knocking on your your window or knocking on the window right. of the war room going, hey, where's my 14-minute update or 15-minute update, right? So. And and executives love to hear we're waiting on it as the answer when, when they, they ask do. you, like, what's they going do. on? When's it going to yes. be ready? We're waiting yes. on it. <laughs> executives right. love this one answer. Right, right. Well... I think there's a better way. Is there a solution? Uh, there's a better way. So <laughs> we're super excited to be talking today about um, Pure Protect Disaster Recovery as a Service. And um, you can kind of forget about everything that you've known previously about Pure Storage. Um, this is really, this is unrelated to, to, um, to our storage. This works with anybody's storage. Let me repeat that. This works with anybody's storage. Um, we love that it works with our storage too. Um, but we're using uh, VMware's VADP. Um, oh, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. A- anyway, <laughs> we're we're uh, we're using the we're we're taking on-premises vSphere. We're replicating that um, to Amazon and converting it to an EC2 instance, so it's native in, in Amazon. Um, it's not VMware in Amazon or VMC in AWS. This is native AMIs that are going to be running what used to be on-prem now in the cloud. And we're going to take care of all of the the details and the bits and bytes in between uh, to make all that happen. So this is uh, a service, obviously. We're going to get those VMware applications over to AWS, and we're, re- we're going to do this uh, on demand. It's not just add? AWS, right? What's it's that? your AWS. It's not just running on that, AWS. It's running on your AWS. Great point. Yeah, great point. Right. This customer provided. Yeah, I did leave that part out. So thanks thanks for uh, adding that piece. Friend. Yeah, you, you got me, as always, right? Yeah. Uh, 
and, and we're going to get into a little more detail on how that works and why we decided to go in this in this direction of, of your AWS and some of the things we covered previously. I think you'll see that. But here's where I was getting ahead of myself, Matt. Um, we're going to take uh, through vCenter, through um, VMware's vStorage, uh, vSphere APIs. Uh, we got change block tracking as well, so we can keep track of all of the changes and so forth. Um, and that helps us reduce the amount of data that we're going to ship over. And then, of course, on the AWS side, we're using uh, native AWS storage services uh, and converting those virtual machines to to AMI. So anything you want to add on this one? This one's pretty straightforward, I think. Yeah, but, you know, I, I just want to reiterate what it is that we're we're doing here, just in case it, it wasn't super clear. It's, it's always worth repeating why yeah. this is a, a cool solution is that, you know, we are taking vSphere to native AWS services. So we're not saying you need to pay for, you know, expensive compute, you know, be, look at VMware Cloud on AWS, right? You're paying for physical hardware um, that is running in, in Amazon's data centers, right? To be able to run ESXi, to be able to build that ESXi cluster. So, you know, we're talking about being able to run these virtual machines as native EC2 instances. You don't need all of that infrastructure, right? Think if you're just doing a simple, failover test. Maybe you just want to test a couple of virtual machines. Well, you don't have to pay for an entire cluster of compute just to run those virtual machines. We're going to convert them to EC2s so you get on-demand disaster recovery. You're just paying for those EC2 instances when you're when you're calling for them. And then, right. you know, as, as Lance pointed out, we work with any storage vendor because we're taking those snapshots of those virtual machines. That's how we're getting the virtual machine data. And then we're shipping it up to the cloud. We're doing that in the vSphere layer. Right. We're not taking storage snapshots because, you know, at that point, we'd be snapshotting an entire data store unless you're using VVOLs. But mm -hmm. you know, so this gives you that granular level of control too to say, hey, I want you. Know, you can pick and choose what virtual machines you want to, you know, send that data up to uh, AWS for recovery. And then, like you said, Lance, the cost saving size of things, uh, the, you know, this was architected with cloud cost avoidance. Right. So using yeah. things like change block tracking. So we're not sending that full virtual machine up to the cloud every time. We're just doing those blocks that have changed on it. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of great benefits here. You know, think back to all the slides we talked about, like these are the problems with DRAS um, mm -hmm. because it is in your AWS account. Right. You can log in. You can see the infrastructure. Right. It's not a black box. You can actually go in and, and yeah. touch it and, you know, see see your data. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of great benefits here to to all of this. Not to mention, you know, what we see with customers and and maybe actually I am getting ahead of ahead of ourselves here, Lance. I think we have a slide just a little for the next yeah. point of some of the benefits of why I use your own AWS account. So I, well, I think I'll I'll take a pause there and bring it back to you. Yeah, let, let's let's pause there and, and we've actually got a question in the queue here. So um, the question is around Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, uh, Gov Cloud. They're wanting to know if those are why those are not viable cloud platforms that we're going to support with Pure Storage uh, DRAS uh, today. You want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, for for disaster recovery as a service, this is going to be separate from you know anything like Lance said. I don't fully agree. You know, forget everything you know about Pure, but you know, in this in this case, yes, this is a totally independent product of Flash Array, Flash Blade, Cloud Block Store, any of that. Right. So it does work on if you are running on a competitor storage, you know, running those data stores on somebody else's storage, that's fine. If you're running on pure storage, hey, great. We love that. But on the cloud side, we're not dependent on something like Cloud Block Store. Now, in the future, yes, we're going to look at integrations, um, you know, with with more cloud providers and being able to leverage um, storage technologies like, you know, some of the snapshots, Active DR, Active Cluster, Cloud Block Store, right? There's a lot of benefits that customers mm -hmm. can get from uh, from those. But, you know, this is the initial launch of Pure Protect ERAS. This is our 1.0 release. So, you know, expect to see a lot more growth in this product. Um, but this is this is the initial release here. It's VMware vSphere to, uh, to AWS. So, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. So great, great question. If there's any more, just uh, please drop those in, in the box and we'll get to them. All right, so... I think this is where you were you were starting to go here. We were going to talk about some of the benefits and and how um, PureProtect DRAS is is a little bit unique in the market. Um, 
I think the first one is the the just in time provisioning um, to let you recover the VM that you need to recover, right? And and reduce those those DR costs. Be be very specific and prescriptive about about which one you talked about. You can put them in groups and different things. And I, I'm sure you're going to show that when we get to the demo. Mm -hmm. um, another piece that that and I and I love this piece the the pre conversion. Um, for critical VMs, I, I think this is a very, very great feature to have. It's going to save time when it comes to the failover. And, of course, you're going to want services like, I don't know, Active Directory online, right, first. You're going to want things like DNS to be available um, as soon as any other, or before any other service, uh, you know, comes online. Uh, for sure. So the, having the ability to do that pre-conversion up front, um, and those are typically not, right, those are not large VMs. So the pre-conversion for those is is super, super quick. And there's, uh, we'll talk more about, I think, that when you get into that in the demo part, but uh, having that ability to do that for sure. And then, of course, being able to test it. I mean, that's important, right? Um, a lot of times we we do the cross fingers and and uh, hope that it's going to work and something doesn't work either something doesn't come up or something got corrupted in the process and it, and it doesn't come up well you need it to come up well we give you the ability to to test it um, and you could even test it to say for patching for example mm -hmm. um, maybe great there's some yeah I, I think that's a great use case and I know. I've I've been there. I've had to roll roll back a, a patch or an update or something because it messed up an application. And being able to, you know, spin that up in the cloud and it be isolated and test it and go, yep, everything comes up like it's supposed to, and get the application owner to verify that it's all good. Uh, I think it, I think it's super beneficial, right? And then of course, our automation, the recovery, uh, right? We can do that with just a click. I think you'll you'll cover that uh, in the demo. Uh, you mentioned it, I think, <clears throat> Matt. Right? We've got these, um, we've got these instances up there, but they're not on. So we're going to mm -hmm. say cost, right? Um, we're going to move the replicate the VMs over, and, and you'll cover the schedule and everything. But we've got schedules in place on on RTO RPO type uh, scheduling for this, so you get what you need out of it uh, as far as a recovery point and recovery time, but with that, you're going you're gonna to save costs. And, and we've got other ways to save costs too, especially when it comes to testing, right? We can scale down these environments. So we're not, maybe you've got a, I don't know, an eight CPU and it's got 64 gigs of RAM or something. That could be expensive to run something like that in the cloud. So we can actually All scale run a that single batch script. <laughs> to run Sorry. a single batch script, exactly, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we can, we can schedule that, uh, not schedule that, we can, Reduce that, um, and uh, um, I, I know you've got that in the demo, so we'll show that to y'all as well. And then, of course, the security improvement with this, um, and and this is one of those where it's like, well, if it's not on, um, and and no one knows it's there, uh, it's it's a little difficult to to hack, right? So you, you can't attack what you what you don't know and what's not not available. So you're going to reduce that footprint. And then of course, um, you know, this, this is one that we're definitely um, doing here at pure. We're about sustainability and environmental uh, things. We're not running hardware, especially old hardware. Uh, we're giving you the options to not have that secondary data center with that old gear that you're having to maintain. And it's, you got duct tape and what knows else on it to to keep it up and running, right? So, um, those those systems a lot of times are are more power hungry than than some of the newer hardware. So, our systems are not uh, the systems in the cloud are not on, so um, not till you need them to be on. And then th this one's this one's super nice, right? So, your data center. Um, has a disaster um, and maybe the whole part of the country is is affected right and there's no place for you to 
bring up your your services for your business. Well, the great thing about this is you can recover anywhere because of the cloud and Amazon's uh, different uh, zones that they have services in. So you can recover anywhere as well as you can be anywhere uh, to recover it because of, of what we use uh, with our uh, Pure One interface, which I guess I'm I'm getting ahead now, Matt. Sorry. <laughs> no, man. All good. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Oh, you clicked it. There we go. <laughs> okay. I'm going hands off. Click? I'll click. It. All right. There <laughs> we go. All After right, you, did sir. You want to take, did you want to take this one or? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we, okay. we touched on, on some of these things already, right? With, um, you know, the cost control piece of it. We're not having to run a secondary data center at this point. We're not having to cool all of that hardware, pay for all that power. So, you know, whether your organization is environmentally conscious and if you have ESG goals, right, this is going to help you to, uh, you know, certainly get there a lot faster than if, say, you had a second data center and, you know, basically doubling your carbon footprint. Uh, but, you know, here in the States, at least most organizations are going to be cost conscious. Um, so, you know, we're, we're more concerned with the, uh, um, you know, power bill that we're uh, faced with every month. So, um, you know, there's there's certainly that that cost control side of things. But also, you know, by using AWS, what we see is a lot of customers are overbuying on AWS services and and they're doing that for good reason, too. They're doing that to reach certain discount levels. Right. So. You know, we certainly see a lot of customers banking a lot of resources that they're not using ultimately to save money, which I, I don't get how that works. We'll sell more. I don't know. It's volume discounting. It's yeah, magic. It's but, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. I'm, I'm an IT, not an economist. But, um, right. you know, so so there's all these additional resources, right? There's an overflow every month that, you know, turns into like service credits and things like that. So why not leverage these resources that maybe your organization is overbuying on, um, you know, to, to effectively get, you know, your your uh, disaster recovery without the additional budgetary burden, right? Start using those service credits. Hey, you want to do some disaster recovery testing? Great, great use of those service credits, right? Um, and then of course, hey, if disaster does in fact strike, you know what? You're going to reduce the cost, to, you know, certainly minimize the cost that, um, you know, is incurred with, uh, um, you know, having to fail over those virtual machines, right? Because we're, we're yeah. keeping your data safe, but we're also giving you the infrastructure to run it on, or really AWS is giving that in infrastructure. Um, but you're only paying for that that virtual machine. The other thing is, yeah, maintain the custody of your data, right? The only data that it gets shipped because this is disaster recovery as a service, the only data that's getting shipped to the Pure One cloud is just you know the metadata that we need in order to be able to you know help you create groups of virtual machines and do boot you know boot order uh, prioritization and and things like that, right? We're not collecting any of your uh, production data. Or anything like that. It's getting shipped from your data center to your AWS virtual private cloud. So you've got chain of custody the entire way there. And you know, it's not the the issue where, where Lance had said of, you know, you're trusting your provider to keep your data safe. And then also what happens if you do decide to cancel that contract and move on? Well, do you know that they're gonna delete your data or could it hang around on a on a disk or on a tape somewhere um, that could be picked up and and you've got another issue on your hands, right? Here, you log in your AWS cloud, you can see all of your data, right? You can see that VPC, you can touch it, feel it, feel good about it, but you're maintaining custody. And then the last part, service credits, we already touched on. So <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of benefits to uh, bring your own AWS cloud um, that, that we can see. And that's why we're really excited about this product. Yeah, I think the... Custody of your data and and having customers, you know, have that control and maintain that themselves is is super critical. I, I know that's one of the things that that I really like about this product or this service. Mm -hmm. Well, we probably touched on, uh, you know, what does bringing your own over building your own means. We probably touched on a lot of these already, um, and we've kind of made it so you don't have to be an AWS expert, right? Or um, you don't have to dig through dozens of pages of documentation to, to stand up this recovery site on your own. You, you're not building it yourself because we're going to do a lot of the heavy lifting and the hard work for you, which Matt, is that is that part of the demo today? Going through a That setup? is. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And 
and it, we've we've made it so simple you think there's no way that could be it but but it really is um i mean you see some of the things here the landing zone uh repository the ec2 instances all of those things get get right sized for your applications we're going to maintain your boot order we'll touch on that we'll re-ip the applications as well so we're doing a lot of the hard work for you so you don't have to worry about it so you don't have to be that expert when it comes to aws any, any other thoughts here matt yeah I, but i think i'm going to add them during the demo to really drive right. things home and, and yeah that's fair illustrate just how simplified we've made this yeah so everyone remember this slide when, when matt gets to the demo and you can you can you can see. call me out so, if i miss something okay we'll do we'll do and of course <laughs> um right we're, we're going to help you bulletproof your dr um and give you that clean start point and that's all going to be handled through uh pure one um as matt mentioned earlier this is where the metadata you know the the schedules the groups what vms belong to what policies those types of things which i'm probably i'm probably spoiling the demo a little bit but um this is all where, where that's stored. And of course, this is accessible anywhere. Uh, so not only can you recover anywhere, you can access this from anywhere as well. So great, great way to do it. So let's illustrate what this looks like and, and get a little bit more nerdy into okay. what the heck are these guys talking about? Pure One, disaster recovery as a service. How does all this stuff come together? So I'm going to advance here to this slide and really kind of go into a little bit more detail what we're doing, right? So at the top here, we've got Pure One. Ho hopefully everybody on this call, uh, you know, if you're a Pure Storage customer, you know Pure One, uh, pureone.purestorage.com. It's our storage management platform, uh, software as a service that's available to every Pure Storage customer, right? If you're an active customer of Pure Storage, you've got access to Pure One. You can do a lot of really wonderful things with it, including disaster recovery as a service. So, you know, you're going to log into Pure One and you're going to see a new disaster recovery uh, new menu option, right? Your as menu option. And that's going to be where Pure Protect lives. For non Pure Storage customers, same thing, right? You're going to log into Pure One, pureone.purestorage.com, and then you're going to access your disaster recovery as a, as a service. And the great thing here is we're not relying on your infrastructure whatsoever, right? Your data center could, heaven forbid, be a crater in the ground. You can still log in to pureone.purestorage.com and get to your disaster recovery to hit that big red button and fail over to the cloud, right? So just think about that for a second. So how does this work with your on-premises, vSphere, getting everything to AWS, all of this stuff, right? What are, what are we really going to ask you to do here? Well, really, we're going to ask you to deploy an OVA. Right, deploy a virtual appliance in your vSphere uh, ESXi or in your vSphere environment, and it's going to communicate with uh, a vCenter, and it's going to give us the again some of that metadata, um, virtual machine names, things like that, to help you to do you know build out that orchestration, build out your policies, all of the things that we need um, within the UI. Right. Next step is building out that EC2 virtual private cloud. Right. As Lance said, you don't need to be an AWS expert to do that. We've we've basically we, we've built a wizard to do all of this for you. Um, and I'll show you in the demo what all of this is. But basically, you know, this this EBS uh, 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 virtual private cloud that we've spun up in your AWS account, this is your disaster recovery landing zone. Right. There is an EC2 instance that that needs to run in there. Um, and that's basically just handling the uh, the orchestration of, you know, replicating that data. Um, you know, basically it's going to land in, in S3. Uh, we're going to process it in, uh, and, and basically convert it into an EBS snapshot, right? So there's, there's, uh, additional cost savings there, um, just because we're pooling everything together. Um, so, you know, we've again, really architected this with uh, cloud cost avoidance. Um, so yes, you are going to have to pay for storing those virtual machines in AWS, of course. Right. Um, but that's basically how we're doing it is is we're we're um you know shipping all of that data that we capture from um from vcenter so that that virtual uh appliance that lives in your vSphere environment that's also going to coordinate the snapshots right it's going to talk to um vcenter and say okay go ahead and snap this volume it's going to talk to the host it's going to pull 
um, you know, those snaps out, look at the um, change block tracking, ship that data up to S3, and then we uh, um, store that into an EBS snapshot, essentially, right? Then when it comes time to actually hit that big red button, well, that's when we, we actually do the conversion and we spin it up as an EC2 instance, right? And that virtual machine is now living in AWS. So if you're doing testing, um, you know, maybe you have a, 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 a bastion or a, or a jump box in there, or maybe you're going to console the virtual machine directly. Um, but, you know, for something like a production failover, well, you know, that's where you'd provide a, a VPN or a direct connection to that VPC, right? Um, but when we spin up that that virtual machine and do that conversion to EC2, we're going to do all the driver injection. Um, we'll we'll re-IP the virtual machine, so it's going to come up in this in this completely isolated environment, unless you get that VPN in there, right? And to be able to get that traffic, um, you know, back to your uh, production network. Um, but you know, to, to Lance's point about doing some of those testing and doing patch testing and things like that, you can do this testing in a completely isolated environment, right? You're not at risk of um, you know, impacting your production. So yeah, maybe all of this looks complicated, but I want to show you how simple it actually is. Uh, oh, of course, the last piece here is be able to fail back, right? Um, your, your virtual machine. So of course we can do that conversion from EC2 back to vSphere. This isn't a uh, migration tool. It's full disaster recovery. So, you know, once your site's back online, we can get that data back in there. So let's jump into the demonstration here now and Lance speak up if you can't see anything. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through the installation process and really show you how simplified, you know, we've taken all of that architecture with uh, uh, AWS and made it really, really simple to the point where you could take this project that could take months, right? When we were doing disaster recovery design, it was months every, every iteration, right? Where we had to go back and forth and find the right budget and the right right solution for our organization, that took months. And so what we've done is basically taken that entire process and made it something you could do during lunch if you wanted to. Um, so let me just show you how that works. And the first step is of course to install that virtual appliance in your vSphere environment, right? So we're gonna uh, get that installed. There's a license key that we provide, um, you know, when you do that deployment of that virtual appliance. And that key is actually used to basically for us to find that appliance, right? That appliance is going to talk to the Pier 1 cloud over uh, 443. And, um, you know, with that license key assigned to that uh, to that virtual machine, we're going to know that, hey, this is your organization's uh, virtual appliance. So the next step here is to connect to the DRAS instance, right? You've got it deployed in your uh, vCenter. So here in Pier 1, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do, you know, some basic configuration stuff, like how do you talk to vCenter? Right in our documentation, we've got um, you know role-based access controls um, for you know basically the minimum permissions that we need for this account. Um, you can configure the source there. So now we're talking to the vCenter. Um, then we can just do some basic configuration of that virtual appliance, like your quota, right? Because this is essentially also going to be a cache, right? As we're collecting those snapshots and sending them up to the cloud, well, we've got to cache that data while it's getting shipped over the WAN, right? So. Uh, provide some information uh, about you know the resource pool and you know how we want to configure this virtual machine, as well as the disaster recovery network, right? So we've got our cider here um, built out with a, a you know sixteen uh, uh, you know slash sixteen in here. So this is where I define that that network where I want my virtual machines to spin up, and then you know we do the configuration of that virtual appliance, and now it's time to start building everything out into AWS. Okay, like that was it. Like that's all your on-prem stuff is taken care of. Now on the AWS side, I can select the region that I want to deploy this into, as well as provide an access key and a secret key, okay? We do document all of the steps to um, basically generate these keys with the proper roles. Um, but if you're like me, kind of, I don't really wanna do that. Um, there is also a cloud formation template script that you can just copy and paste. It's gonna do all the exact same steps um, and basically spit out the access and secret key that you need here. Um, so yeah, take that route. That's my advice. Um, but then, you know, once we're connected to, uh, to AWS, right, we're going to configure the uh, controller, which is that EC2 instance that's up there. And now watch as we're going through and we're actually spinning up the virtual private cloud, we're spinning up the network, building out the firewall, all of these things, right? So with that, our virtual private cloud is up and running. We're, we're ready to start receiving data. Um, but the next step here is, of course, to create a network for that replication traffic. Um, this is something that actually we're, we're optimizing for the next release here. 
Um, so you you won't even need this step, uh, I'm told. But you know, basically, like creating that VPN connection from your on-premises appliance to the virtual private cloud, boom, we've taken care of all that for you. So with that, we are now disaster recovery ready, right? I can start replicating my virtual machines to AWS. So with some basic information, like what is the IP range that I want? What is the CIDR that I want for um, my disaster recovery network, as well as the you know secret and access, uh, you know the keys to connect to AWS? That's about it, right? So we've taken that huge project and we've made it, again, something you could uh, feasibly do within a, an average lunch period. Um, or lunch break, lunch period. That sounds like school. So, all right, let's let's jump into the next piece of this, right? And and talk about how do we actually protect those virtual machines, right? We've got the VPC, we've got the disaster recovery landing zone. We don't have any data in there yet. So, here's how we manage everything. Um, again, we're in Pure One, and we manage this through policies, groups, and plans. Okay, nothing nothing too too ground shaking, uh, uh, earth earthquaking, ground shaking. Um, there, right? But let me show you what, what each of them does and how we handle these in, in this release of uh, Pure Protect DRAS. First thing we're going to do, we're going to build out a policy. And this is where we configure our RPO, uh, uh, you know, our, our RPO. So I can say, hey, I want to take a copy of the recovery point objective, right? I want to take a copy of this virtual machine daily and I want to ship that up to the cloud, right? If you want something a little bit more, you could go every few hours here. Um, but in this case, I'm going to say once a day, take a snap of that virtual machine ship it up to the cloud, right? Um, DR retention. So this is going to be how many days worth of uh, copies of this virtual machine do I want? This feeds right into that ransomware story, right? Being able to, you know, not only obviously you can recover from the latest copy, but you can go back in time and go find a clean copy to recover that virtual machine from, right? Um, so, you know, this is where we set all that up. That's, that's the policy. That's your RTO, right? Next, we're going to create a group of virtual machines that we can then assign to that policy, right? So I'm going to say I've got two virtual machines here that I want. Um, I'm going to say VM5, and then we'll go ahead and we'll assign a policy to it. And then under advanced settings, so this is where, you know, Lance had talked about the pre-conversion piece of it, because yes, there is, um, you know, a, a period of time to run these conversions from a, you know, vSphere virtual machine to an EC2 instance, right? But for those mission critical virtual machines, we can do a pre-conversion. So every time we get that virtual machine's data up in the cloud, boom, we're gonna convert it to EC2. So when you hit that big red button, that virtual machine is ready to go. This is where you configure all of that. Um, so that's the groups. Oh, actually, I said two virtual yeah, machines. Yeah, you forgot one. I did, yeah. all right, let's add yeah. one more. Okay, so now we get two virtual machines in this demo group, right? Um, so now the next step is gonna be to create a plan. Right, we've got our policy, we've got our groups. Now, what's in the plan? Well, the plans here, and, and this is this is my gripe about the product, is that this isn't a giant red button visually. Like it actually is the giant red button in the product, but it doesn't stand out as that. But this is the production recovery here, right? When crap hits the fan and you need to fail over all of your virtual machines, this is the one that you hit. But these other or this plan over here and this other one that we're going to create, these are going to be more of our, these are going to be our test plans, right? So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to create a new plan, call it demo plan because that's original. I'll apply the group to it. And then, you know, because this is for testing, this is where we can do that scale down. We don't need eight CPUs and 64 gigs of RAM just to make sure the application's running. Maybe initially you want to, you know, run this without any sort of scale down just to make sure that you know, the performance is, is what you would expect. Um, but, you know, for, for additional cost savings, I can scale this down as much as 75%, right? So if I'm just doing testing to make sure that that patch is going to, you know, not screw up the application or make sure that the application's running, I don't really care if it's uh, running at, you know, eight CPUs and 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, right? I can actually take that down to 75%. And Lance, I don't know if you're a math major, how quick you're at math, but I don't know, 75%, that's like, one or two vCPUs and a lot less RAM. That's, yeah, that's exactly a lot less RAM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that's everything in the recovery plan. Now, of course, there's the orchestration piece of this too, right? You've got uh, like we were talking about, um, you know, all the benefits of snapshots and backups and DR, right? The two things that backups are lacking. Um, you know, it is it is that point in time recovery, but the two things that it's lacking is obviously the infrastructure to run these virtual machines on, 
and then also um, the orchestration piece of it, right? How do we how do we power up these virtual machines? And so I can say for this group that we created, I can say, hey, boot all of these virtual machines, both of these virtual machines at the same time. But maybe there's a dependency here, right? So I can simply just by dragging VM4 up to the top, I can now say, hey, VM4 needs to boot up first. And so, you know, we, we can handle all that orchestration within there. So with that, right, I can go ahead and I can do a test failover and I can select a specific copy if I want to go back in time, right? Or I can just say in this case, if I'm doing a test failover, maybe I just want the most recent copy. And you'll see the same thing when you do a production failover too. Uh, I'm just not allowed to hit that big red button since the last demo. Uh, so I'm stuck doing a plan here, but um, in any case, right, you will see the same thing if you're doing a production failover. Um, so, hey, let's go ahead, do that with the most recent copy. I can go in, I can monitor that job, see that it's in progress. I can see that it finished. And then again, for testing, right, I could either console that VM directly. I could, um, you know, use a, a jump box or a bastion host or, um, you know, if I have a VPN or something like that, right? There's a lot of options here for uh, performing some of these tests, depending upon the application, right? Um, but um, that's that's really Pure Protect DRAS in a nutshell, right? We went from nothing to having a full disaster recovery solution, at least for, you know, these two VMs um, within just a, a matter of minutes. And yeah, of course, it's a demo. It's a little bit faster um, than, uh, you know, what it would take the average person. Lance and I have done this a few times. But it's it's a very simplified product, and we've we've adopted, you know, one of the great things about pure storage, like our tagline is uncomplicate data storage forever, right? We love simplicity, and so that's why you know we're really excited about this product because we've adopted that same purely simple philosophy that we've carried through, um, you know, all of our our storage, uh, you know, purity and uh, you know our storage platform and everything. So yeah, I mean that's uh, that's everything in a nutshell here. I think. Let me stop sharing and we get one or two more slides here. So with this being a 1.0 release, right? Um, what are some of the requirements and what would make you a good fit for this product? This product is available today. So if you're interested in it, and I hope you are, talk to your pure account rep, talk to your uh, you know trusted partners. Tell them that you're interested in this product, right? And, and take the next step here because it is a, a very cool product um, it is a greatly cost reduced way of doing disaster recovery, right? And hopefully what you saw today is, uh, um, you know, compelling enough for you to talk to your account team. Basically, you know, what are some of the things that you need to take this to the next step? Well, of course, you need a vSphere environment, right? This is this is for vSphere, um, you know, but also an AWS account. You know, 1.0 release here today is uh, vSphere 2 AWS. So, hey, having an AWS account really helps. If you don't, you know, we can help you with that too. Um, and and again, you don't need to be an expert in AWS. So, um, you know, I would even say that's kind of a soft requirement. Like it is a requirement, right? But you don't have to have all of this stuff in place today. Uh, we can certainly help you out with that. But if you're looking for a new, you know, DR strategy or maybe implement your first DR strategy, right? What a great way to look like a hero for your uh, management. Say, hey, you know, we've implemented this, uh, you know, really cost reduced uh, disaster recovery solution, you know, um, yeah. Hope you get that promotion. And then also, you know, if you want to do cost reduction or, you know, you're, you're hearing that, uh, um, you know, Hey, we're going to be a cloud first company or, you know, we want to leverage more cloud or we need to save money on AWS. Again, this is going to be your secret weapon. Go to your bosses, get that pat on the back, get that promotion. We're all pulling for you. So Lance, I think with that, we're going to, we're going to wrap things up and turn things back over to Scott here. Um, cause we're, we're going to give away some money now, right? Yeah. That's absolutely right. Um, hey, yeah, thank you both. Uh, you know, Lance and Matt, very great presentation, great demo. Uh, really appreciate you coming on to uh, to tell us about Pure Storage. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, yeah, for attending. Good to be here. All right. And as they, uh, as they mentioned, we do have one more piece of business, and that is the prize drawing. So the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card today is Hunter Chun from California. So congratulations to Hunter. Uh, and I, I think I'm uh, mispronouncing that last name, but it's spelled C-H-E-U-N. So we'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Pure Storage for making this event possible. And thanks as always for attending and for your excellent questions. That concludes today's event. 
Have a fantastic rest of your day.